whose idea is all this? Oh, question. look at the camera. Oh, so, so, so. And I'm only an old bag, Hannah. Granny, were all those pearls on that picture up there made? They are real pearls from the western coast of Australia and they are the original shell and those are all embryo pearls developing and I toted them round for years, so Jura, and they were brought back prior to the First World War. So I had them here and after Jack died, made that picture. So who got the pearls for you? Your great granddad. Were you born in a hospital or was No, it? at home. Um, June the 30th, 1920. My father had been in India in the Great War and he loved it. He was on the hospital boat sailing up and down and he and my mother married fairly soon after the war ended and I was born um, in the following June. Um, in Tamworth, my paternal grandfather and grandmother's house and they, he was a market gardener. Were you the only child or were oh, there, were no, there a no. few my of you? My brother was born seven years later, but that was down at Dover, at Hamilton Road in Dover. And then my sister arrived a few years after that, oh, Janet right, okay. Mary, and my brother was um, Leslie, Leslie John, and he was a lovely, clever young lad and an adult. And he was your favourite, was he? Uh, he and I were like twins and we got on extremely well. But sadly, he has gone. Money was very short, but I had lots of aunts and uncles and cousins and they were all very kind to me. And um, I, in the summer holidays, from when I achieved school, I was would, would shuttled around them. As a result of the war, the world was in a very poor place. Yeah. My grandfather, where I was born at Eastview, he was a market gardener and used to take all his produce into Brum, as he called it, twice a week with a horse and cart. My father was soft and he would take me for walks and learning to play tennis. He was looking after all the wounded men in the First World War on the hospital ships yeah, and going right out to Trincomalee and all the other well-known places in India and he just loved it, my father, he was at his best then. Granny, one um, something I heard about you was that after school you used to wander down the lanes instead of going home to avoid doing the washing up and the dusting. It's quite true. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy school? Loved it. I, I would have given anything in the world to have gone on to college and university. Really? What would you have studied, do you think? English. Was Many. it an option then, Granny? Was it an option for you to go to college? No, no option no at option all. No option at all. People, was it... Only... Yeah, I went to the marvellous new school. It was called the Central School, and it had just been evolved, and all of our teachers were university graduates, and they were first rate. Mm. But... I excelled history, geography, art mm. and English. I had a very nice boyfriend who was going to be a minister huh. and he um, and we were going out to South Africa as missionaries. What happened? And um, he got to Kellam College in the north of England and qualified and got his minister. But he got caught up in the Second World War and was killed in Birmingham, Burma in the fighting. And in the end, his relatives told me that he said there was nothing left but God. And meantime, I had met your dad in 1936, granddad in 1936, and it went on from there. And you met him, was it on the beach? On the beach at Dover, where, where I, it was a Saturday afternoon and he was, I was looking after my charge and he thought I was a rich young widow 
which I wasn't, <laughs> and we arranged to meet. Then the joke was, there was the Dover Castle sitting up there, and he asked me the way to Dover Castle. But he had a very nice pair of brown broke boots uh -huh. on, which took my eye. We arranged to meet the following day, somebody in a board with rain in Dover all day, so he searched around, and it was impossible to go out. And then on the day, they had a great procession through Dover with all the dignitaries. And uh, <coughs> for the funeral, George V, and, oh, and, uh, and I made a hand stitch to scarf. I thought I should have something dark, and I've still got the scarf. <laughs> he told me all his family history on the second time we went out, and what and where had happened. He'd lost his parents, and his in. Um, stepbrother and whatnot, they were newly married, they didn't want him. So at Christmas, well, that would be 1937, he went off and joined the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I got a picture which he was very proud of, and all the time he was, well, in bed dying. He was pointing at this picture because he was so super fit and he was at the Royal Tournament in front of Queen Mary. Oh, well, that, that was part of 36, and they're there, and he was always so proud of it, but he was super fit. We all knew war was coming, mm -hmm. and really he wanted a home and a base, and me, so we found a house in Andover, and then um, he was at home for quite a time, and we had a an acre of land there, and we grew crops and things like that. And then war came, and for a quite a time, he was still at airfield situated around Andover. There was an airfield there. Mm. And we had so much fruit and vegetables, I kept half the road going with food. <laughs> and when the Americans arrived, um, they were in the town. Your mother had just, well, she was young then. And um, they were down at the greengrocers, and we had lots of corn on the cob, and I sold basketfuls of them to all the Yanks, and they were very pleased with all the corn on the cob. <laughs> One and three a cob. I made a small fortune. Uh -huh. Everyone knew war was coming. It was inevitable. Mm. And the nations had just been trying to get their defences and uh, their stocks of ammunition, etc., all stocked up, ready for when war began. Were you scared about the war when it, when it was coming? Of course you were apprehensive, but you knew it was in inevitable and it had got to be done and got through, so it was simple. Yes, you, you were very scared, and uh, Jack was in the Air Force, and uh, he it anything could happen but you just ploughed on. We had an airfield at Andover and the nearest bomb was 200 yards but we were quite high up where the house was situated. We could see Portsmouth, Southampton and London burning on the horizon at the height of the bombing and the Messerschmitts, I think they were, mm. would cross over Andover and your grandmother and I would go under the table or the stairs and they you could set the clocks by it. They, they came meticulously at the right time every evening and they returned in the morning about three, four o'clock in the morning having completed their missions. Okay. So tell us about yeah. Susan. She hated walking and the last time before London really was bombed and we took her up to London and we bought her, um, went to the theatre, had some lunch and went to the theatre and we went in a box at the side and we were there others. She would never walk, so she were everywhere was taxis in London then. And stupidly we bought her a box of marbles which she wanted and she proceeded during the show to slowly drop the marbles <laughs> down. But she hated walking. Oh, and what was she like as a baby? Lovely. Was she? Yes. Good baby? Oh, yes. Yeah. Most of them, um, the others were. Yeah. So she was born in Andover, was she? 
Yes, yeah. 40 miles to the road. It must have been very difficult because that was the year the war started. Grandad must have been very busy with work. And you've yes, got a young baby. But it was gardening principally because we, he even then, the garden bug had got him. And he had a, we had an acre of ground there. And we grew a lot of food and we sold it down the road. Mm. And we had an orchard there. It was just at the end of the so you, road. There was no difficult feeding your, difficulty feeding your family no. as such? No. no. But was Grandad busy? Was he very busy at work at that time? Oh, heavens, yes. Yeah, he must have done long hours during the um, he was fi He was finally posted to somewhere to in Essex again. And then he, end, he was at the airfield at Andover. And then he ended up at the war at Cheltenham with a um, hundred wafts on radar. So what year was Bill born? February 1944. So when did you leave um, Andover then? It was 1945. It was within one or two months of the war ending. Oh. And we, we'd been up once and I'd cast my eye of a very run-down small holding with a family that was very glad to sell and it was very isolated with a quarter of a mile on our made-up road but it seemed like heaven to your dad and I was quite glad to get away and start another life again. But why Anglesey? What had attracted you to Anglesey? Because his Jack's passion was mountain climbing and that was oh. the nearest access and also land. Right, because Grandad had done quite a lot of mountain climbing as a child, hadn't he? Not as a young child. <clears throat> when he became his teen, he would cycle up from Ilford and on old bits sit up on a big bike to work the mountains. And one night he landed in the Snowdonia and slept a night in the cave and the men working on the mountain railway the next morning were amazed to see him. <laughs> he was quite mad like that. Didn't he carry a bike up Snowdon? Yes. I heard he that. Did was that was it. So by then you had you had Susan, uh, you had yes. Bill, you'd found a new home within two or three months of the war ending. Um, and what was your intention when you came to Anglesey? What were your plans? To make as much, to make a living from the land. Principally. And would Grandad have worked? Uh, well, the family, there the were those two, and Bill was away in the children's hospital in Hes War for nearly two years because during the war we had to register for milk. And we had a new milkman in Andover, and the milk was polluted by the badgers. Oh. And he, um, we got to Anglesey the first year and we went to South Stack and walking back on a very hot day, all those steps, and he couldn't walk, so doctors, and it was found that he had bovine TB and it was caused by the polluted badger milk. Mm. And I only used to see him perhaps once a month. Mm. And Jack used to go out once a month. But in those days, he didn't allow you to go more. And I have all the letters that the sister wrote to me about him, his, mm. what he was doing, because he was very naughty and they had to tie him into bed. So Eric, Eric was born in um, a nursing home rather than home, because it must have been, oh, yes. would have been very difficult for a midwife to get to you, wouldn't it? No. Well, there was no question of it, because... the. The nursing home was so good and the food was so good and you stayed there for a whole week and it was as good as a holiday. Well, Rosemary came along later and so she was only two or three years between her and Eric and they jailed and they would wander fields and all over the place and go off for a whole morning at a time. The, all my children went to school in the village school okay. and your grandmother told me last week that they have pulled it down and built houses on it. And the outstanding thing of Sue's life were, was 
she was the first carnival queen in Clandestant after the war and Cledwin, who's the local MP's wife, came out and crowned her and she made the headlines, still does a bit. <laughs> and I made all the clo cloak and dress and she still got everything. How long was it um, after you moved to Anglesey when Grandad realised that he'd got to go and find a job? Um, he, first of all, when he went into the outside world, he was um, selling uh, fruit and vegetables, that produce. Mm -hmm. And one year we grew two, three and a half tons of carrots, and so he was known as the Carrot King. Gosh. And everybody bought those. But um, meantime, the first job he got was as part-time postman in Clambacrath. And I would sit up and beg a uh, bike, and it was patching post office's serge trousers forever. And in those days, the postman had to work Christmas Day and take the parcels round. Oh, so that was his first job? Yes. And then what did he do after that? Fairies. Fairies? Uh, fairy aviation. Fairy aviation, yes. Right, okay then. And that's when he got to know this particular man who was working Which with was the, the famous test pilot. Pilot, that's right. Okay. So we migrated to Maidenhead. Right. And what was he? What was he working on there? PA. And the first job he did for Peter Twist was arrange Mike Hawthorne, the motor racing driver's funeral. He had to go and do that first of all. So you arrived back in Maidenhead and. Sue would have been about 16 or 17, she? She immediately went back to working in the bank. Okay. And Bill? Bill was over his um, illness? He was still in school. Right. And Eric... Young and, teenager. Yeah. And uh, Eric would have been uh, again... The ditto schools. Mm -hmm. okay. And they hated it because they had a Welsh accent and they were largely Welsh-speaking. Oh, they were all And it Welsh was speaking. very much resented down And they must there. have missed um, Anglesey. They, must they the did, freedom. but uh, Eric w was particularly, was very, very thrilled and he used to go to gigs and things, even then. I was working in um, a tobacconist for three years and that was in education in Maidenhead and Diana Dorge, her chap had the, just across the road, his cafe, and she used to come across and patronise us with her blonde flowing locks. <laughs> and all the fancy people living down the river by the Thames, they came, but they were the worst payers for their paper bills, and I was very glad to escape from there and got the job in London. And I travelled up to London each day and uh, learn the bones of the job. We had 3,000 book titles and I, I did know my stuff. I had, uh, I was known as the human computer then at McGraw's and I'd finished the catalogue. I did all the spreadsheets um, at Timpleth and posted them on, I went round. And it was all based on my editing work at McGraw's and um, <clears throat> and all the stuff. I've still got sample orders upstairs I came because they kept the uh, schools in the East, Japan, China, Russia, were all re-establishing their educational programs and you get orders written on rice paper and it was very difficult and I handled all that. Best job of my life. And food was very cheap in London then and we were right in the middle of London and we would go to a fresh place to eat every day and you could get freshly cooked halibut for three and six. Mm. We thoroughly enjoyed going up and down on the train from Maidenhead. And what about Bill? Did he enjoy being back? Yes, it was all right. And what were his interests? Oh, he worked for Tron Citron. And he also worked for travel firms and travelled a lot going abroad. Okay. It's a period I don't know a lot about, mm. um, say 18, 19, 20s, but he's been everywhere, a bit like your mother. But he enjoyed his motorbike, didn't he? Oh, motorbikes. The first bike was an old brought, well, Norton brought home as a complete skeleton, and he and Jack put it all together, 
and he still has it and B he now has five vintage motorbikes. And, and Eric loves his music and obviously like getting out and about. And oh, what, pop. And didn't he like, um, was it horse polo, Eric liked? Yes, he was, it had a name, a group, and they went round on horses and lances and having battles. Rosemary was more of a home bird. She liked her Definitely. Home. Mm. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was. She ended up as secretary at Mars, and she was very good. At Mars? Oh yes. I didn't know that. She came straight here when we, Jack and I came back. She was secretary at Mars, and my um, my chest of drawers wardrobe testifies it because every time she comes, she te sorts out my fifty jumpers. When did you um? Get first, get electricity. 1959, and it was a great day. And we could have electric light, and we could uh, have electric fires. It was wonderful. Was it like breath, like literally changed your life? Oh, it was wonderful to get it. Yeah, it made everything easier. And um, yes, <clears throat> and uh, electric irons civilization are caught up with us yeah. yeah and you could have a pump on the well which was wonderful water it was like champagne yeah what did you feel about that moment when you were first oh, told you're thrilled your absolutely thrilled so there was Stephen the eldest yeah and then Sylvia she was a bit of a touchy baby though and then Andrew did you spoil them well, put it this way, and Andrew still remembers it. Every other Sunday from the day your grandmother married Alex, the father, we went to tea with him on Sunday and vice versa until we left May, um, Timples. Did you get on well with Alex? Loved him. He was a lovely man. Oh. He was great. Oh, you know how he escaped from the Russians. No. He was... What? <laughs> Your okay. education's been neglected. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. He was in the Hungarian Hussars, an officer, and doing very, very well. The war came, and he was partaking of it, and then... He was taken prisoner by the Russians. Mm. I think it was in the Ural Mountains, and they were imprisoned there. And he used to tell me they were imprisoned in concrete cells, and the men would all lie on the floor. And one, when one turned over, they all had to turn over. Food and everything was very short supply. <coughs> so he and some others escaped while the snow was on the ground one winter and they crawled across into Austria, got under the barbed wire and escaped to freedom. And various Red Cross, I suppose, and everyone helped them to escape and eventually he arrived in England. Mm -hmm. And he met some very helpful people, principally among them Mrs. Miller. She was very wealthy, but she took a, a great liking to Alex and helped him a lot with learning English and everything. And he was very clever and he became a machine tool worker and he earned a good wage and then ended up in Slough and then met your grandmother at a dance. Well, we were there every other Sunday, all the years you were small at Slough, and it went on here. And I, and then, unfortunately, when he got here, it was a bit of a loose end. He didn't know what to do in Patelli. But he would come over and see us on the bus. Mm -hmm. And then he became ill, unfortunately. And his only vice was he was a terrible bottom pincher. 
<laughs> and there was a very wide staircase from the basement up. I think it was a good house there. And he did it to Joan, Bill's wife, once, and she never forgotten it to this day. <laughs> so he was a cheeky chappy? Yes. <laughs> What were your fondest memories of your of your life so far? Having my children, getting married, um, and I was very happy doing my job with McGraw Hill, the publishers. Um, but I've endeavoured to make the best of the things. Um, the countryside, seaside, hmm. travelling, um, yes. Miles and miles on the back of an old two-stroke motorbike where the forks had to be greased every hundred yards. <laughs> Honeymoon in Dog Air 5. On the Wednesday we gave up, it was raining. We rode, set off at one o'clock. We were in Preston at nine o'clock, got a bed and breakfast, still raining. Went on to Echo Fecken and Gretna Green, still raining. Went across Hadrian's Wall to Newcastle, had lunch in Newcastle. Still raining, went on to Newark, commercial hotel, Brown Windsor Soup, still raining. Set off for Andover the next day, and the sun came out. And I left my the miners' boots. I'd never seen a mountain till I went on honeymoon. And um, I never got up a mountain and left them there, brand new pair of boots for some tramp. Back to Andover, and the sun came out, went to Bournemouth the next day, and we still got £40 in our pockets. And that was the honeymoon. Rain, rain, rain. Ground winds of soup. <laughs> Happy, Happy birthday, Adrian! Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Happy birthday, birthday. Congratulations! <laughs> yes. I hope you have a lovely 100th birthday. We'll miss you. Happy yeah. birthday. The we queen, wish you'd have been there for you. The we Queen can't you. come because she's locked We've down got, uh, with Philip. Yeah. <laughs> she sent you a card with you. her best wishes. Jasmine's yes. made you a cake. <laughs> We've eaten some of it. <laughs> <laughs> we got a bit hungry. <laughs> and I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Hi, Granny Gladys from Flackwell Heath. I love you. I love you and happy birthday. We wish we could have been there for the big day, but we're sending greetings from afar. Can George say something? Happy 100th birthday! Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Granny! Happy birthday to you! I love you so crazy. You bring us all smiles. Every time I see you, you make me smile. Granny, you always told me that th everything always ends up okay, and so far you've been right. I'm always interested to know what you're about to say, and it's always good. We love you. Happy birthday. Happy <laughs> birthday. Happy 100. Woo! Woo Hi, Granny. It's Fiona. Happy 100th birthday. I hope you have a fantastic day. Well, Granny, congratulations on 100 years. Happy birthday. What an achievement. Well, you've had a pretty good life. Um, you married a wonderful man called Jack, who we absolutely adored. He was just such a genuine gentleman. And sadly, you lost him some years ago. But life has continued, and, uh, and we, we just love you so much, Granny. You've had an extraordinary life and you're quite eccentric in some ways, actually, because your ideas um, are outlandish. But I think that's what we love, love you most for, actually, is the fact that you intrigue us. And from your exotic gardens and monkey puzzle trees and your collection of ornaments, weird and wonderful, and the things that you did for us as children, um, the wonderful um, witch film that you made for us. It was scary, uh, very scary, but um, it used to send my mind into overdrive and I just seemed to want more um, each weekend when we came to visit you. 
and those memories of Maidenhead were absolutely wonderful. We used to come across most Sundays to see you all and uh, we'd see the best of Eric and Rosemary and Bill letting their hair down and dancing while we, me and my brothers, used to play under the table um, while you adults would be chatting away. And I used to love your house in Maidenhead um, with its um, wonderful um, Chinese cats um, bottles of brightly coloured potions. Um, it was just all so wonderful. And then we obviously then moved on to Timporth. Wow, what a place that was, with its exotic tropical gardens and a, a monkey puzzle tree of all things. And then we'd play in the stream for hours. Um, and then we'd often have a walk around your gardens and then finish off with tea, which was always luxurious with your lovely meringues, gooey meringues and trifles and oh, huge, huge gattos filled with cream and strawberries. Um, it was just all so wonderful and you really have been the best granny anyone could possibly have um, and I absolutely adore you for it, which is hence why I come to see you so often and love doing things for you. It's been wonderful that we've had this place in Anglesey so we've been able to see you more often and uh, and hope to continue to do so. So I know life's not as easy as it should be at the moment for you but we hope to make it better and we'll make the best of everything and can't wait for this lockdown to end and we'll come and see you more often. So Granny, you are wonderful, the most perfect Granny and I love you for it and I wish you a very, very happy day. Please enjoy it. I love you, Granny. Bye-bye. Happy 100th birthday, Granny. I really do hope you have a brilliant day. Congratulations on this astounding achievement. It really is amazing that when you were born, David Lloyd George was Prime Minister. Again, happy birthday with lots of love from Byron. Happy birthday, Granny. What a wonderful birthday it is. We just wanted to say, Happy 100th birthday from all of us. And we look forward to having a uh, snog soon. I miss our little snogs, Granny. You've done so much with your life that we could only dream of, but it's so nice to hear your stories. Hope you have a wonderful day and we'll all see you soon, including this little one. <laughs> Say happy birthday. Happy birthday, Granny. Happy birthday, Granny. <laughs> see you soon. Love you lots. Happy 100th birthday, Gladys. I hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy yourself with your family. Um, please excuse the, uh, the COVID-19 hairstyle. But I haven't had a haircut for about three months, so I'm looking a bit wild and woolly. Anyway, what a wonderful, wonderful life you must have had. A hundred years old, you have seen some incredible things, some good, some bad, some indifferent, but I'll bet you remember them all clearly and have very fond memories and stories of what you've witnessed. Anyway, what a fantastic achievement and congratulations to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Gran. Can't believe you're 100 today. Well done. All those years of experience, the changes and all the stories that you can tell. Um, we hope you have a great day. Um, shame we can't be there. Would have loved to have had the tea party with you, but we will all try and make it up as soon as possible. Hope you're well. Send in lots and lots of love on your birthday. A big special day for you today. We love you. Happy birthday, great gran. It's a shame we can't be there. I wish we could be. Sending lots of love. Hi, great gran. It's Chrissy here. I hope you're feeling good um, um have a great day bye <laughs> bye gran bye. from sophie alicia and krishna and doggy and doggy the dog and shola's going to send her own video we love you bye, bye. happy 100th birthday great gran hope you have a lovely day missing you lots love shola Welcome to the day, Ma. Sorry we can't be with you, but hopefully we'll see you in a few months' time. Don't know how you've managed to get to 100, but congratulations on this great momentous date. Yeah. 
She also also wants to wish you a happy birthday too. Happy birthday, Mum. Happy birthday. Thanks for all you've done for us over the years. Cyber wishes you a happy birthday too. Hey Gran, it's Graham. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, I wanted to give you a little video message to wish you a very happy birthday. Uh, your 100th birthday. Can't really believe you're 100. Uh, it's amazing. Um, I wish we could all get that far. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot, heard a lot and have a lot more wisdom than we could ever dream of. Um, so yeah, I was just thinking about uh, some of the memories when we were growing up and um, some of the things that really stick in my head with Tim Puth and uh, you know, one, one day we made a lovely seat out of pond weed for you, um, which you very graciously sat on, even though you knew it was a trick. Uh, which we thought was very funny. Um, the dams in the stream, romping around the forests, you know, uh, granddad teaching us to chop logs and uh, driving on the trusty tractor. So just a few of the memories, but they were uh, uh, amazing. And, um, you know, you're very much the head of the family. Uh, everyone turns to you for advice uh, and your, your infinite wisdom. Um, so yeah, thank you for being amazing uh, and looking out for all of us. And uh, we love you very, very much. We, we miss you when we're not with you. Um, and uh, when we are with you, we want it to last longer. So uh, a very happy birthday for all in the uh, the Barnes family. Um, can't wait to see you soon. Love you very much. Uh, take care of yourself. Love you. Bye. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Dear Gladys. Hello, Graham. I don't know if you recognised that harumping. I'll do it again. Hmm. Hmm. Getting warmer? Well, that was Grandad's stock in trade response to anything you used to do. And uh, I was thinking about, well, how would Grandad? Um, react to you reaching 100 and looking back you know granddad never really laughed or he, he wasn't very uh, demonstrative but his i remember that stock in trade hmm. Hmm. a very non-committal response wasn't it gran yes it wasn't mocking it wasn't supportive it was very, you couldn't complain about it at all. You couldn't tell him off about it. Yes, it was a, hmm. What was he really thinking? What was he really thinking? Clever man, clever man. So, from Grandad, hmm. Well done, Gladys, of reaching 100. Yes. And I raise a glass to that. I think it's something like something that Monty Don would say, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, Grandad's response would always be the, hmm. I remember you uh, would turn up at Pacelli, yes, and uh, Grandad would be back at the car, you know, trying to get the bags out, yes. And then I'd look at Grandad and, uh, and think, where on earth are all these bags coming from? But Grandad would just say, hmm. Yeah. Then in the house, you'd be bragging to Mother how many layers you had on today. Seven? I got seven. Yes. First. Blouse. And the cardigan. Cardigan. Jumper. Coat. Yes. There was a competition of how many layers you could actually be wearing and still be cold. Again, turn back to Grandad. So many lovely memories uh, of you both. And yes, I really wish Grandad could be here to also celebrate with us your wonderful achievement. Yes, you may be also harumping saying, hmm, it's only another birthday, but it certainly isn't, Grand. So many, many, many happy returns. And um, yeah, I hope you, know, you enjoy uh, seeing us uh, in the flesh, hopefully we'll be there on the day, um, but I hope you enjoy seeing the family too. Yeah, so, yeah, again, I raise a glass to you. What an achievement. 
Many happy returns, Granny, on your very special day. This is sent with lots and lots of love from us all, me and Katie especially. I was really sorry not to be able to get to see yourself, but I know there's a lot of love going or heading your way. So I'm sure you'll be thinking of all of us as much as we're thinking of you. I can't believe it's 100 years, really. So long. That's so amazing. Well, if I live to 100 years and live through the amount of things that have happened in your lifetime, <laughs> it's astonishing. Sending people to the moon and things like that. Anyway, but it's the little things that I remember so much growing up with you and Sunday splashes down at your house, batter bird cakes and all the rest of it, followed by terrifying home movies of you uh, trying to put an end to poor dear Zebedee. <laughs> Still makes me laugh, that does. I must catch up and find those films again. Oh, dear. And then there's, of course, your dear Jack, who's... Uh, couldn't have been better granddad either really so you were a real team and you were always there when we needed you and uh, so as I said we'll be thinking of you especially I was thinking of you actually because we were at a nursery yesterday and we're seeing all these wonderful plants that you probably would love to go around seeing with Jack and Cordelines included and there was even a, a franchise there that was called Maidenhead Aquatics so it's funny how these things pop up all unexpectedly anyway Here's again, lots of love to you and thinking of you very, very much. Okay then, take care now. Love, Steffi and Katie. Bye. Hello, Mum. Happy 100th birthday. Wow. This is a day I could never have imagined. Fancy, me at 80 years old, having a mother celebrating her 100th birthday. When I tell people that I have a mother who is celebrating her 100th birthday, they find it very difficult to believe. Thank you, Mum, for being there, for me through thick and thin, for being my constant companion as well as mother. For all these years that we have been so lucky to share, having always lived not far from each other, making it possible to enjoy our family lives and many other happy events. Remembering all the happy days at Timpul, my foundation years in the lovely countryside of Anglesey, for the fulfilling years helping you and Dad on the farm. Haymaking, picking potatoes, carrying water, cooking and churning butter and many other things. It was a good time. Thank you for all our little outings, trips for lunches and shopping. It was all a good time and I miss it. But I hope that when the coronavirus has passed, we will, be, we will see more of each other again, God willing. So dear Mum, have a lovely birthday and thanks again. God bless you always, Sue.